Chapter Three of the First Christmas Tree, a story of the forest by Henry Van Dyke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, The Shadow of the Thunder Oak. Withered leaves still clung to the branches of the oak, torn and faded banners of the departed summer. The bright crimson of autumn had long since disappeared, bleached away by the storms and the cold. But to-night these tattered remnants of glory were red again, ancient bloodstains against the dark blue sky, for an immense fire had been kindled in front of the tree. Tongues of ruddy flame, fountains of ruby sparks, ascended through the spreading branches and clung in fierce illumination upward and around. The pale moonlight that bathed the surrounding forest was quenched and ellipsed here, not a beam of it sifted downward through the branches of the oak. It stood like a pillar of cloud between the still light of heaven and the crackling, flashing fire of earth. But the fire itself was invisible to Winfred and his companions. A great throng of people were gathered around it in half-circle, their backs to the open glade, their faces towards the oak. Seen against that glowing background, it was but the silhouette of a crowd, vague, black, formless, mysterious. The travelers paused for a moment at the edge of the thicket, and took counsel together. It is the assembly of the tribe, said one of the foresters, the great knight of the council. I heard of it three days ago as we passed through one of the villages. All who swear by the old gods have been summoned. They will sacrifice a steed to the god of war, and drink blood, and eat horse flesh to make them strong. It will be at the peril of our lives if we approach them. At least we must hide the cross if we would escape death. Hide me no cross, cried Winfred, lifting his staff, for I have come to show it, and to make these blind folks see its power. There is more to be done here tonight than slaying of a steed, and a greater evil to be stayed than the shameful eating of meat sacrificed to idols. I have seen it in a dream. Here the cross must stand and be our recede. At his command, the sledge was left in the border of the wood with two men to guard it, and the rest of the company moved forward across the open ground. They approached unnoticed, for all the multitude were looking intently towards the fire at the foot of the oak. Then Winford's voice rang out, Hail! ye sons of the forest. A stranger claims the warmth of your fire in the winter night. Swiftly, as with a single motion, a thousand eyes were bent upon the speaker. The semicircle opened silently in the middle. Winford entered and his followers. It closed again behind them. Then, as they looked around the curving ranks, they saw that the hue of the assembly was not black, but white, dazzling, radiant, solemn, white the robes of the women clustered together at the points of the wide crescent, white the glittering Burmese of the warriors standing in close ranks, white the fur mantles of the aged men who held the central place in the circle, white with the shimmering of silver ornaments and the purity of lamb's wool, the raiment of the little group of children who stood close by the fire, white with awe and fear, the faces of all who looked at them, and over all the flickering, dancing radiance of the flames played and glimmered like a faint vanishing tinge of blood on snow. The only figure untouched by the glow was the old priest, Hunrad, with his long spectral robe, flowing hair and beard, and dead pale face, who stood with his back to the fire and advanced slowly to meet the strangers. Who are you? Whence come you, and what seek you here? His voice was heavy and toneless, as a muffled bell. Your kinsman am I, of the German Brotherhood, answered Winfred. And from England, beyond the sea, I have come to bring you a greeting from that land, and a message from the All-Father, whose servant am I. Welcome, then, said Hundred. Welcome, kinsman, and be silent, for what passes here is too high to wait and must be done before the moon crosses the middle heaven, unless, indeed, thou hast some sign or token from the gods. Canst thou work miracles? The question came sharply. 
as if a sudden gleam of hope had flashed through the tangle of the old priest's mind but winford's voice sank lower and a cloud of disappointment passed over his face as he replied nay miracles have i never wrought though i have heard of many but the all-father has given no power to my hands save such as belong to the common man stand still then thou common man said hunred scornfully and behold what the gods have called us hither to do this night is the death night of the sun god baldor the beautiful beloved of gods and men this night is the hour of darkness and the power of winter of sacrifice and mighty fear this night the great thor the god of thunder and war to whom this oak is sacred is grieved for the death of baldor and angry with the people because they have forsaken his worship long is it since the offering has been laid upon this altar long since the roots of this holy tree have been fed with blood therefore its leaves have withered before the time and its boughs are heavy with death therefore the slavs and the winds have beaten us in battle therefore the harvest have failed and the wolf hordes have ravaged the folds and the strength has departed from the bow and the wood of the spear has broken and the wild boar has slain the huntsman therefore the plague has fallen on our dwellings and the dead are more than the living in all of our villages answer me ye people are not these things true a hoarse sound of approval ran through the circle a chant in which the voices of men and women blended like the shrill wind of the pine trees above the rumbling thunder of the waterfall rose and fell in crude cadences o thor the thunderer mighty and merciless save us from smiting heave not thy hammer angry against us plague not thy people take from our treasure riches of ransom silver we send thee jewels and javelins goodliness garments all our possessions priceless we proffer sheep will we slaughter steeds will we sacrifice bright blood will bathe thee o tree of thunder life floods shall have thee strong wood of wonder mighty have mercy smite us no more spare us and save us spare us thor thor with two great shouts the song ended and the stillness followed so intense that the crackling of the fire was heard distinctly the old priest stood silent for a moment his shaggy brows swept down over his eyes like ashes quenching flame then he lifted his face and spoke none of these things will please the god more costly is the offering that shall cleanse your sin more precious the crimson dew that shall send new life into this holy tree of blood thor claims your dearest and your noblest gift hunrad moved nearer to the handful of children who stood watching the red mines of the fire and the swarms of spark serpents darting upward they had heeded none of the priest's words and did not notice now that he approached them so eager were they to see which fiery snake would go the highest among the oak branches foremost among them and most intent on the pretty game was a boy like a sunbeam slender and quick with blithe brown eyes and laughing lips the priest's hand was laid upon his shoulder the boy turned and looked up in his face here said the old man with his voice vibrating as when a thick rope is strained by a ship swinging from her moorings. Here is the chosen one, the eldest son of the chief, the darling of the people. Hearken, Bernard, wilt thou go to Valhalla, where the heroes dwell with the gods, to bear a message to Thor? The boy answered, swift and clear, Yes, priest, I will go if my father bids me. Is it far away? shall i run quickly must i take my bow and arrows for the wolves the boy's father the chieftain gundar standing among his bearded warriors drew his breath deep and leaned so heavily on the handle of a spear that the wood cracked and his wife irma bending forward from the ranks of the women pushed the golden hair from her forehead 
with one hand. The other dragged at the silver chain about her neck until the rough links pierced her flesh and the red drops fell unheeded on the snow of her breast. A sigh passed through the crowd, like the murmur of the forest before the storm breaks, yet no one spoke save Hundrad. Yes, my prince, both bow and spear shalt thou have, for the way is long, and thou art a brave huntsman. But in darkness thou must journey for a little space, and with eyes blindfolded. Fearest thou? Not fear I, said the boy. Neither darkness, nor the great bear, nor the werewolf, for I am Gundar's son, and the defender of my folk. Then the priest led the child in his raiment of lamb's wool to a broad stone in front of the fire. He gave him his little bow tipped with silver, and his spear with shining head of steel. He bound the child's eyes with a white cloth and bade him kneel beside the stone with his face to the east. Unconsciously, the wide arc of the spectators drew inward toward the center as the ends of the bow draw together when the cord is stretched. Winford moved noiselessly until he stood close behind the priest. The old man stooped to lift a black hammer of stone from the ground the sacred hammer of the god Thor. Summoning all the strength of his withered arms, he swung it high in the air. It poised for an instant above the child's fair head, then turned to fall. One keen cry shrilled out from where the women stood. Me! Take me! Not Bernard! The flight of the mother towards her child was swift as a falcon swoop but swifter still was the hand of the deliverer. Winfred's heavy staff thrust mightily against the hammer's handle as it fell. Sideways it glanced from the old man's grasp, and the black stone, striking on the altar's edge, split in twain. A shout of awe and joy rolled among the living circle. The branches of the oak shivered. The flame leaped higher. As the shouts died away, the people saw the Lady Irma with her arms clasped around her child, and above them on the stone altar, Winford, his face shining like the face of an angel. End of chapter 3 Recording by Penny Ann